panellists. Um, I'll quickly introduce them. So, uh, starting from the my right, we've got Peter Cowley, who's Angel Investor of the Year for this year, which hasn't finished yet. Apart from next year. Um, who's also founded 12 companies and invested in over 35 startups. Um, pretty impressive. But then, uh, following on, we've got um, Mod Wenner, Brees Wog who is founder of the Angel News Service, which is a site where you go for all your information to do with angel investing, and he's been going for a, a number of years now, I think, and also does a number of other things, runs events, um, as co-founder of the UK Business Angel Institute, and also involved with Albion Tech and General Venture Capital Trust. And then we've got Scott, <laughs> Scott Halton from Investors, which has also been around a while, I think started in 2004. Um, and before that, career in sales and marketing for big companies, um, including Mars. Um, and also himself has raised successfully venture capital, finance, angel investment, bank debt, and small firms loan as well. And finally, we've got Bill, Bill Morrow, who's um, uh, well, founder of Angels Den, which is um, pretty well known, or at least I've heard of it, or come across it a lot. Um, which is Europe and Asia's largest business angel investor network with over 5,000 business angels. Um, okay, I'll hand over to our event partners in a minute just to give you um, a short background into what they want to, a few words they want to pass on. But um, before I forget, there's a hashtag angel deals, hashtag angel deals. If you can use that, um, if you, any words of wisdom that you feel like tweeting, please do, and then I can pick that up afterwards and embed a few tweets in my uh, blog post write-up, which will be on my jonathanlee.net site. Um, so if you can do that, that would be great. Um, and also, I'll let you know on Twitter when I've included them. Um, okay, well, I'd better hand over to, um, I think, firstly, Hayley from Elance, um, just for a couple of words. <coughs> Thank you. Do you have it, Charles? Yeah, no, it's here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, all I was going to do is to share really quickly um, a story from one of our startups um, that I discovered this week, which is a pretty cool one. They're called Rome to Rio, and they do um, they do door to door uh, travel instructions, and it literally is door to door. So you could be like from here to um, to like a tiny little ferry port in. North Canada. Um, and um, yeah, so what I thought was interesting about these guys is um, they were founded a couple of years ago by uh, two uh, ex Microsoft engineers, pretty smart guys. Um, and what they wanted to do is enable you to get travel instructions for anywhere, literally anywhere in the world. So they started off and they were using a lot of APIs um, and manually inputting, actually roped in like friends and family, parents to be manually inputting data, but they were really, really struggling in regions where they just couldn't get hold of structured data, and that's a lot of re regions in the world. So um, what they've done now through Elance and Nodesk is they've built a team of around 30 freelancers who actually go out, research this data, and then input it for them. Um, so that, that, that lady there is actually taking a picture of a ferry board in Ho Chi Minh. Her name's Vin, and she's a data researcher. And she literally goes around taking pictures of these boards and then uploads it so that their site works. Their site that gets like over three million uniques a month. Um, and their whole suite of apps work. And by doing that, they could go from 100 routes per week to 1,000 routes per week, which has enabled them to raise finance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that is just one story. Um, there are many others like that. Um, but just in brief, we have two million businesses using the Elance and Odesk platforms and about eight million freelancers. And what we do is we connect those businesses with those freelancers and give them room to collaborate on a project. Um, and we cover over 2,500 skills. Lots of people associate us with the tech stuff, mobile development, software development, programmers. Um, but we also do customer service and data entry and writing and blogging and translation. and random research like you've just seen. Um, anyway, that's it from me. If you'd like any more information about how to get going, we are used by a lot of startups, about 90% of our customers are small businesses and startups, um, because it's a very effective way to grow a business and to scale very quickly. If you'd like to understand more, then come and find me afterwards. And that's it. Thanks very much, Tony. And then um, got Dennis as well, who's here. Yeah, I'm also you. Talking to you about opportunity to get 40,000 pound to, to win, free money, I think. For <laughs> That's a good way to make friends. No, really, two things very quickly, and I appreciate Jonathan giving me a minute to chat. Uh, my name is Dennis Moynihan. I'm the uh, London director for something called EIT ICT Labs, 
really trips off the tongue. But that's funded by the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. And the reason we exist is to drive innovation. We do that with big research partners like Imperial College, UCL, IBM, Intel, et cetera. But we also do it for entrepreneurs, uh, startups, SMEs, who are trying to scale or, or bring their idea into market. We also work on education, but that's not why I'm here tonight. And so first of all, um, we have a London location. We're part of a pan-European network that includes Berlin, Paris, Eindhoven, Trento, et cetera, Stockholm, Helsinki. Um, but in addition to our business development accelerator support, which we provide, um, we have a competition going on that closes at the end of the month, and I've been getting the word out to the London ecosystem. Uh, it's called our, our Idea Challenge, and Jonathan has sent an email to the entire group, but I've also left flyers out on the back. We're basically calling for uh, interesting ideas, essentially your business idea if you're a startup or a small-scale SME. And the topics are around things like cyber, uh, cyber security and privacy, uh, Internet of Things, smart energy systems, or the one I'm, I'm most focused on is urban life and mobility. And uh, the first, we're, we're looking for uh, people to submit their ideas. We'll shortlist those. We're going to have a judging uh, session in each of four cities around those topics. First place is 40,000 euros. Second is 25. Uh, thousand euros. Uh, third place is fifteen thousand euros. But we also provide free business developer, uh, business development accelerator support. So free office space for six months, coaching, mentoring, access to finance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I just want to call this to your attention. I've left flyers out on the back. Uh, do, do please take a look. I, I do say it closes at the end of the month, but the the uh, application process is um, lightweight. And beyond that, we're here in London. Um, we're here to help innovation. We're here to help startups. Uh, we don't invest in companies, but we also don't take a cut. So it really is no strings attached uh, thing. We're here to drive innovation across uh, Europe. So thanks. I'm not going to stay around late tonight, but the stuff is here, and Jonathan's emailed it out. So uh, do f uh, feel free to follow up or get in touch. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Alex. Okay, let's see if I can put the screensaver on behind again. Sorry, right, I'll take a seat down here this time. Um, right, okay, well, the usual format is I've got loads of questions, really good questions that people have um, emailed in already, so I'll kind of moderate it a bit by focusing on some of the more interesting ones that I guess is a bit subjective and it's related to my opinion. Um, but then halfway through, whatever, we'll open it up, so if anyone's got a burning question, put your hand up, and then we'll, I'll um, pick you up or... Uh, shout it out, or, or, or if you yeah, feel that's key, whatever, and then um, and then continue discussion between the panelists on, on their views and answers to the the question you have. Um, but anyway, well, without further ado, I think we'll start with um, Anna's question. I'm not sure whether Anna's here. Invariably, ones I pick out, people <coughs> don't turn up. Um, uh, I haven't got a second name, unfortunately. But um, her question is, which other people have asked, is what what's the best way to connect with angel investors and uh, Particularly, should you reach out to people you haven't been introduced to, or should you always um, get introduced by a third party before you approach an angel investor? Um, anyone's keen to answer that first? I'll happily start. I, I'm, not too I'm not too sure this microphone's it's working on here. Can, yeah, can everyone hear me? I don't think perhaps you can. I'll carry on. Um, to, so I think to answer the question, what I would suggest first of all, I think what perhaps a lot of angel investors would expect also is that um, you must really reach out to those friends and family, the people that you know, the close contacts, because they have to invest in your business if, it, if you are a very early stage, if it's a sort of pre-revenue startup, because if those guys are not investing, then why should a third party, more sophisticated angel investor actually sort of take the plunge? So I kind of would urge you to reach out to your, your own networks initially at the very early stage, and then really the more sophisticated, you know, experienced angel investors would come in after the sort of seed fam friends and family round. Okay. Um, but then actually, when you come to approaching angels, should you, is it, do people like it when you, I, I guess, the equivalent of a cold call, or should you, uh, um, you know, or, 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 or
Yeah, well, I would, um, uh, I mean, what Investors is, is uh, we're a, a, a FCA-regulated corporate finance house. We've been around for 10 years, we've got 12, 1,200 registered investors. They're all sorts of sophisticated, uh, high net worths. So we're a formal kind of network, and what we would sort of advise is obviously feel free to approach us as an angel network, but there are obviously competitors here this evening and, and other sort of angel networks. That's a way of obviously reaching out to the sophisticated uh, angel, business angels, private investors. Um, yeah, well, I, um, I don't mind direct approaches, providing that people have looked at my website that's got a number of criteria on it. So uh, if you Google me, you'll probably find me. And the criteria, there are about 10 of them, and they're very specific. Um, they're mainly B2B, a lot of hardware, not much software. Uh, and there are two responses I get from, uh, by this by email. Either people go through all 10 of them and individually answer each one correctly usually, so they are, that is of interest, or they'll completely ignore it and send me something I'm not in the slightest bit interested in. And I've got this problem there where I say, I, I reply, which is a mistake, and then I say, great, not for me, good luck, and they come back with these 27 questions they want answering about why not. So I don't have a problem with direct. Um, you will find, uh, I think, as um, has just been said that by Scott, that getting in through another route of, of a soft connection, which you'd expect, will make it much easier. And then going in through a group of some form, getting on some sort of list, it still doesn't really, I mean, I'm very involved in a number of groups, particularly the Cambridge Angels, and we get, and I actually go through the cold calling list, which is probably about 60 a month, and we probably pick out one of those 60 that will take further to a, an, another event, which will just be an informal event, never mind the big events where we do invest. So if you can make that contact, get in through somebody, get a recommendation, that works much better. That's obviously easier in a small city like um, you know, Cambridge or, or possibly Oxford, or not so much in Bristol, I don't suppose. Very difficult here in London unless you do the rounds around here. That's my view. I always think it's a slightly different issue when it comes to looking for money, which is the first is you have to compare your shoe leather and time at one end of the spectrum versus hiring some, you know, I don't know, I'm going to use the word Goldman Sachs advisor who you pay a fortune to to help you raise the money. And you have to work out what the um, trouble, what the, how much time it will take you, depending on which route, and what it actually will cost you to raise the money. Um, so I, as a general rule, I'd say always try and go through a recommendation, but even trying to get the recommendation, it's not going to be worth much unless that recommendation is genuine. So you're going to have to spend quite a lot of time. So before you decide which route to do, actually decide how much time and expertise you have. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs underestimate the need to seek advice and counsel from people like Scott and others on how you actually go about this sort of fundraising. Because the trouble is you usually only have one chance with um, an investor. And if you sort of get it wrong, it's hard, isn't it, to go back again. So it's not saying they'll never forgive you, but you know, they, as you see, they're, they're seeing dozens and dozens of deals a week. So you need to make sure you get it right when you first go around. So I'd encourage you to um, really plan what you intend to do and then really target who you're after. There's probably only six or ten angels who would be suitable for your company. There might, uh, you know, there might then be a wider range of more passive people. But, you know, just scattergunning a whole load of angels who've put, their, put it on their LinkedIn profile is not going to really get you anywhere, I don't think. We see on <coughs> 140 business plans a day, 186 um, this very day, we take one, maybe two of them on because we have a really keen understanding of exactly what it is that the angels are looking for. And how do we know what the angels are looking for? Because we see 400, 450 of them a day telling us what they want to invest in. And even an idiot like myself can begin to see a correlation between what it is they're asking for and what comes in the business plans. So exactly as Mod Winner says, um, I, I think it's, um, you know, is it, is it best to find one in your own? Hell yes. It's cheaper because I'm going to rip you off for 5% of um, the money that, um, that you get from an angel. But it's, um, um, it's time versus um, you should be doing something else with your time. And like most of the 140 business plans that we see and, uh, and our um, colleague at the front, um, the wonderful thing about entrepreneurs is that they will never be able to follow a list of 10 things that they have to do. It's just not part of being an entrepreneur. Um, it's, that would be too incredibly difficult. That's not what you're about. You really just want to go and run your business. So it's a matter of, it's a very American question as well. I mean, should you be introduced to someone? Doesn't really work like that in this country. 
because there aren't many angels that go, I'm an angel. Um, and there are very few of them that will find your deal interesting, which is why you need to go to places that have a very large number of angels. And you don't have to. You can network and bootstrap um, um, as long as you want. I think perhaps top of the three is uh, the management team. Uh, I would suggest that it's not really about the proposition, it's more about the execution and um, you know, having a, a, a team, uh, and I do mean a team actually, we often see just sort of almost sort of a very thin, you know, one individual or couple, you know, and uh, so we're looking at a, a proven team really that have got a good track record, either in that space or a, a sort of you know, relevant sort of industry. Um, it's got to be, what we're looking for is something that has already, um, you know, it's got a great sort of solving a real problem, uh, something that is actually very, very scalable uh, as well, and perhaps the fourth, I know you asked for three, I think, actually, but, you know, there's many things, but it's got to be something that has got to be a realistic exit, uh, and everybody forgets the exit, apart from the investor, who, for, for, that, for that person, it's the most important thing. I'd say I'd say what you need is a you you we did some research um, in the summer about what makes a team investable, and the clear message was two is better than one, in terms of co-founders. Um, so find yourself a friend, um, uh, and um, you was just remind me of what the come on. Um, yeah, uh, tech founder. I th I think the point about tech founders is that you you need to be showing investors that you can actually do something that it's not an idea. So you need to get something to a beta. Ideally, you need to get a customer, and that's going to be really hard if you're not if you're trying to do something techy and you haven't got a tech founder because it's going to be very expensive to buy in that talent. So, so do, do you own do you, do you own the IP, and who can support it? Um, I'd put numbers one and two, both team actually, uh, maybe even number three. So it's it's the management team, their passion, their drive, their ability. Uh, the fact they'll listen, the fact they'll pivot if you know, you know, if it's necessary, um, and uh, yes, yeah, so on the second part of that question, I personally, I'd, a yes, you definitely need two minimum, and four is probably too many, so two or three, and one of those, if it's a tech, it must be tech, um, in my view, uh, one of the co-founders. There are examples where there's been a, a, a great team that brought a tech in later as a sort of later stage co-founder that might instead of having, you know. 33% of the company just have 15 or 20, but that's very important. To outsource it all will not work when the, the problem starts. It depends on the level of tech, of course, but if it's, if it's a sort of audience where I suspect we've got in here, which is mainly tech, you will need somebody. I think sort of fo <coughs> following on from that theme, <coughs> it's, it's, it's not so much about the team, but it's about the personality of the team. I think you can have, and especially geeks, the geeks are particularly bad at this, um, of the 30, 40 people we meet every week in the British Library, in Hong Kong, in Honolulu, and we just opened up in Mexico, 36% of them fall at the first question, which is, uh, John, really nice to meet you. Tell me about your business. So you can have the best team in the world. You can have Harvard, Yale, you can have um, 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 Cal coming out of your, um, out of your neck. But if you cannot explain in very simple terms, in a passionate kind of way, you have the communication skills to actually be able to impart. And geeks, particularly bad. Not as bad as academics, <laughs> but pretty bad. 36% of people with pers continuing, just no idea after half an hour what the hell you are talking about. Genuinely, how could a normal human being 
do what it is that you're doing. How can I relate to that? I have no idea what you are talking about. And it is as if a verse from the Quran has hit them in the face that they have to understand. Someone, an angel has to understand what I do before I, inv before I invest. Well, yeah, just for a giggle. Number two, just backing up what they're doing. You have to sell something to someone who isn't your mum. Um, you have to have proven your actual business model. And then thirdly, you have to have an unfair advantage in the marketplace, which you have secured. So it has to be a copyright, a patent, a trademark. You're going to have first mover advantage. You're going to have some intellectual thing. You're going to have your supplier's children locked in a cellar until they have signed on the bottom line. Um, some shit like that that actually differentiates you from other people. So like Skyscanner is out of business now thanks to um, these kids here. Uh, wh what is your unique advantage? What is going to stop um, um, a huge company coming in and just taking over the business which you've actually proven. We often see an awful lot of, well, we see a lot of tech companies, and I think one of the um, things you have to choose, and sort of leads on from what we're talking here, is that you either want to just pitch your investment to techies, which is fine, because they talk the same language and they can understand you, or if you're going to talk to a generalist audience, which in the main, most angel investors are probably more generalists, there'll be some that are very, very um, sector focused, but then you need, you really need to articulate it in generalist terms, and the easiest way probably is just to sort of, we want the case study, we want the consumer, the customer experience, how do you make your money? We're not actually that interested in the whizzy tech, we just want to know what problem is it solving, how do you make your money, why is this going to be fantastic, who's going to buy you, and then under, and later we'll have a look under the hood and see what the tech is, but you know, you either want to be generalist or you want to just talk to techies, really. So you need to choose which. You need to get, you need to get two things. You need to get a 12-year-old, um, because if a 12-year-old can understand what you do, then an angel probably will. And um, the second thing you need is to get a woman um, in the team as well, because a woman in the team, women are 2.2 times more likely to get the funding than a guy. <laughs> and we'll talk about it over a beer out right there. Uh, well, I'll start with that one. The, um, it depends on what stage, of course. It, the initial stage, the last thing I want to see is, uh, and as we did once, a 127-page pa pitch deck. I mean, you're never going to read that. You're not even going to read the executive summary in that situation. So it's, it's a one- or two-page IM to start with, or, or whatever you want to call it, or, you know, in teaser or whatever, to the point where there's some interest is actually generated. And, of course, it's different for investors because they need to get it through a process before they get in front of angels. Or, or want to, because you actually enhance the value, add value during that process. But in the case of me, we want to get somebody in front of us so we can see them and see them pitch, which it comes back to what somebody just said about how well they present and how well they, they interact with the particular audience. Once you get to the point where you are interested in Angel, as you'd expect, you start digging deeper and you start, in fact, I, I can't probably express it correctly, but it's something like get very excited and then delusion, disillusionment gradually sinks in. You might just invest before disillusionment becomes negative at some point. So it's always downhill, it appears, from the point of, not always, that's very unfair. Probably. And so that's when the, the business plan or whatever form, et cetera, n needs to be produced. And, and my best investment so far, which isn't very far from me, you could probably throw a cricket ball at it, was a four-page business plan to start with, including financials, though. Whatever was said, the financials, you know, you get the hockey stick type stuff. We never believe that, but at the same time, they've got to be thought through in the same way as you know, the, the exit was mentioned earlier on. Um, I'd say one of the most important things is I quite like seeing a sort of five to seven page, almost um, adapted PowerPoint, but made to look like it's turned into a PDF, so it looks like, but with lots of images. Um, big problem I see is that entrepreneurs tend to spend too long explaining what they do which is, that's the bit you should take half a minute. You talked earlier about the sort of, you know, one minute elevator pitch and that the rest of the time or the rest of the deck should be about the background support. So the case, 
why the customers want it, the numbers. I think people encourage you to not look at the numbers because apparently it's all myths. But it's not really about whether the numbers are myths. It's about whether you have the competence and the um, commitment to actually do a really solid exercise about the financials. And if you're sort of not ready and not prepared to do that, I would argue you probably shouldn't yet be looking for angel money. Because you know, th th running a business is about turning a profit and preferably more and more profit every year for several years till you exit. So if you're not getting that bit right from day one, that's a skill you need to find in one of your co-founders. So that's my point. Yeah, actually, I'll add a couple of um, points. Um, we've got a, um, a very experienced angel investor that the team will sort of know this individual very well. Very, very, you know, he's been around uh, a lot actually, but. Anyway, he tells a very, very good story, actually. Well, there's two stories. The first thing he says is, um, when a company suggests, would you like to look at my business plan, what he actually says is, no, I'd, look, I'd like to look at last year's business plan to see what you've achieved that you said you were going to achieve. So that's quite an interesting way of looking at it. He also then said, actually, the only connection between a financi the financial forecasts and the business plan is usually just the staple, and that's it, really. <laughs> you know, sort of... So, it, it really is important, actually, um, when an angel, when an investor, when we get more enthused about a business, it then all becomes about the financials, actually. That is the business plan, is really understanding the financial realities of, of, of the business. So, it, you know, everybody does this hockey stick. We once had a company that, rather than presenting financial forecast, they just actually came up with a hockey stick <laughs> and said, there's, there's my finance, which, you know, every single company has the same hockey stick. So. It's really important to really get under skin of the, the financials, to really understand how it all works. An investor will want to pick it apart, put it all back together again. You need to really, really explain that. You can spend a lot of time and a great deal of energy coming up with a business forecast. 400, 450 angels a day, looking at five, six, seven things, maybe. Less than 3% of them are looking at the numbers. Why they're not looking at the numbers? Because they know they're bollocks. Complete and utter bollocks. They have no idea. What went is spot on. Yeah, you have to do them. You have to come up with it. Not necessarily to get a bean counter on your team. I mean, I'm a sad accountant and investment banker, but I wouldn't want me on your team. You need to have somebody do the numbers for you. You have to have an understanding of what it's about. But if you believe your numbers, the one thing I can tell with any certainty is that you will never, ever get funded because you are naive and stupid. <laughs> it's not going to happen. If anybody in this room is looking for money, if you could tell me what your bank balance is going to be in three weeks' time, I'd be mighty impressed. <laughs> Idiots like me asking you to forecast your cash flow three years in advance. We can always tell um, um, investors from angels, investors investing money just to make a money to return, angels looking to add value over and above, they're the ones that ask for a three-year forecast balance sheet for a startup that's been going for less than a year because they're dumb and they deserve to lose their money because they're looking at completely the wrong metric. So the vast majority, as I say, over 95%, not even looking at the numbers. We, we give the numbers, we do the numbers. No one's looking at them because they know they're rubbish. So you're not looking at the numbers, what are you looking at? Once again, it comes back to just the, the sheer basic facts of what the angel's looking at. They want you to understand how you run your business. Do you understand the metrics? Which, of course, is, is, is then showing up in the business forecast and, and all the numbers, but it's not the be-all and end-all. Um, do you actually have that IP in place? What is it about the team? How much money are you looking to um, have? And it's just for a giggle, break down how much money you need in 5,000-pound chunks. What are you going to do with it? Because it, once again, it's kind of a trick question. How much money do you need? Um, if you think it's going to cost you £470,000 to build a new website, you are stupid and naive and will never get the funding because you're just too dumb. <laughs> so it's kind of a trick question in terms of how much money you're after. And then we come on to the tr biggest trick of all, valuations. But let's, let's keep that for later.
sort of watched and observed and um, I've been fascinated by entrepreneurs and one of the things I've tended to notice that most entrepreneurs are fairly quiet thoughtful people who can be noisy but do tend to you know they're quite cerebral I don't know whether that's something you guys and everyone will have a personal opinion by the way on this um, so um, I look for real sheer what I call c brain computing power you got to gonna have to be seriously clever to be able to get you through all the different challenges you face you're going to have to face like amazing successes and amazing lows and they might come in quite quick succession and vice versa. So I look for that. Um, I look for people who understand the customer um, and also really understand one of the things I think isn't talked enough about is business models. And there's a really good book I recommend you read that's just coming out any minute called The Customer Funded Business um, by John Mullins. And... Um, it goes into all the sorts of business models which generate cash of their own accord. Um, and because those are the ones actually that investors most want to invest in. So as well as looking at your products and your team and your numbers and all that, actually look at like the, the machine that makes the, the thing go round and is it gonna actually scale? Is it gonna create more and more money or does it actually absorb money? So those are my thoughts. Um, the it's important to me that they listen and of course you can't tell that from the first pitch you only tell that if you get interested and they they move on to the next stages um so uh arrogance really doesn't work for me at all uh ability ability to pitch and to present and to and to some extent to entertain a level of humor makes a big difference um the uh but in the end it's it's the per it's the person you're the, the person you're investing in the team you're investing in isn't the team that you see today it's the team you see you know in three four five years time as they uh, you hope they grow with it grow with the business and then connects it so the personalities make huge difference to me um, okay and coming back to something we saw slightly said earlier but it's, it's important now as well it's really important that somebody within the team can actually sell and uh, what I mean by that is we see so many people who are you know, phenomenally techy, phenomenally you know, bright and uh, all sorts of things, but you, know, you need to be able to sell, and, and what I mean by that is actually not sell your products, but sell your business and articulate your business as an investment opportunity, not just as a business really. So it's a, it's a, unfortunately, it's a difficult skill. I mean, s some of us have it naturally and some of us haven't, but you've either got to sort of work very, very hard and sort of you know, stand up and present, um, listen is really important, uh, understanding the kind of audience, Knowing when there's a buying signal as well, you know, you can see if an investor's interested, sort of close it rather than just labouring the point, really. So that's important, the ability to sell. And if you don't have it, you perhaps need to try and bring somebody into the team. I think also it, it's very useful. It, 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 it creates an awful lot of credibility. If you can bring in some sort of advisory team, whether it be a non-exec, ideally if somebody's uh, perhaps investing, a sort of non-exec chairman, or if it's just an advisor and if they're from the, the industry that you're in, then that, you know, that provides great credibility as, as well, really. But, um, I mean, there's many, many different traits, but there's just a couple, I suppose. Um, I, I, I agree with number one and number three. Um, we hold nine pitching events across the world every month. Um, on average, we'll have eight people pitching. Um, we don't hold pitching schools beforehand because everyone apart from Americans is really, really bad, are really, really bad at pitching. Americans just come out of the womb knowing how to pitch naturally. But across the world, we hold the pitching schools for the entrepreneurs beforehand. Um, one, with monotonous regularity, we can tell pretty sure who isn't going to get funded. And that will be, um, back to Peter's point, um, the person who doesn't turn up for the training. Now, it's not that the information that we impart is of such um, dynamic um, stature that it makes the difference between them getting the deal and not getting the deal, but it displays a level of arrogance that they know everything there is to know. Sorry, you're going to tell me how to pitch my business. What, what do you know about pitching? We did thousands of pitches last year. We have an encyclopedic knowledge of why women should pitch in a very different way from guys, why geeks should pitch in a very different way from normal human beings, why, oh, sorry. 
But it's that arrogance which transmutes itself across to the angel. So when you, the angel is then questioning you, you know everything there is to know already. And the big mistake that British people in particular make is that when they are pitching, they are pitching their product. No one wants to buy your product. It's exactly as um, Scott said, it's, it's totally about pitching the company, just for a giggle. Pitching the business is a world of difference away from pitching your product. Well, I, I do hard tech, and um, uh, patents are sometimes very important. I've got something in my bag here, which is a gas sensor, a mobile phone. So that's uh, coming out of Cambridge University. It's already got about nine or ten patents. I've been working on it for about six or seven years. Most of those are granted. That's critically important because this is a massive market. You can imagine, in, you know, next year sometime, they're not out yet. Your mobile phones will be re registering how much NOx, uh, you know, nitrous oxides, volatile organic compounds, and CO there are in the atmosphere around us. More important for the Chinese market probably than here. It's a minute device. It could be copied easily. It's very low cost. It's sub a dollar or so, something like that. So that's really important. I've just come from a, a four-hour board meeting today for a company called Plumis, which is fire suppression systems. We've got a patent. Two reasons for that. There will be three reasons for that for really useful. One, protection from the market. Secondly, the patent box, which is a tax advantage later on. And thirdly, probably for some sort of value um, on exit. The downside is a patent is going to cost you an awful lot of money over its lifetime, and a lot of money. You're talking about t tens of thousands of pounds to get a patent. So there are, there are many cases where f enter entrepreneurs, and this is hard tech, and it may not apply so much in this audience, the, the entrepreneurs think a patent's important. I, I'm not convinced it is. More important, really, is that there's something that the know-how, getting to the market, all the sort of things that we know anyway, than the patent itself. Other defensibility, of course, um, if you've got strong competitors in the market, you've got to keep th something tight. The company I mentioned just around the corner here has got some really deep tech, and of course it's hidden because it's stored away in a server somewhere, but it's actually the know-how in the team. The actual concept is copyable, but they're well ahead because of what they've done so far. I would, um, does anyone, a quick quiz. Does anyone ha know how much it costs to fight, an, fight a patent claim? One or two people? Any, I'd go and shout it out then. What's, how much do you think? Fifteen hundred pounds to fight a patent attack. There's somebody at the back there. How much do they? Think? Okay, five hundred thousand pounds at least. And that's before you've paid any compensation. That's just the lawyers. Okay, you won't if you don't have the right patents and IP in place. You will never be able to do big ticket deals with big corporates because they know about this patent dispute stuff and they don't want to be have find their products vulnerable, being taken off the shelves, whatever, because your IP wasn't strong enough. So. So understand the scale of tens of thousands of pounds versus hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds as the penalty. Um, in terms of, I think, what you've just said about know-how and knowledge and trade secrets, we tend to assume that all IP is patents, but actually you do have all sorts of strengths, and one of the two strongest are trade secrets um, and know-how. Um, and also I think trademarks are something that are much misunderstood because you can get a trademark for about 750 quid. And if you look at Coca-Cola, at the end of the day, it's the, it's the trade secret that's the formula and the brand, isn't it, that makes you buy Coca-Cola. And they could restart as Coke tomorrow if all their factories burnt down because they've got the formula and they've got the trademark. So um, don't necessarily assume it has to be a very expensive patent to give you the IP that you need. No. Nothing really much to add, but apart from where you have any IPR, just please make sure it's in the company name, not in your name, uh, because you will not receive investment <laughs> whilst it's in your name. It needs to be, investment is into the company, not into you as an individual. Quite a simple point, really. Making money. Well, 
Well, that varies, of course. My, my, as I said earlier on, I'm hard tech. I'm, if it's software, it needs to be B2B SaaS. Um, I'm also, because of my background in electronics, there's an awful lot of hype and opportunity in Internet of Things, Internet of Everything, whatever you call it. I've got a wearable on both wrists. Uh, this is my, k they're both Kickstarter actually. This, this uh, is a pebble that's been, I bought because this was so late. This, <laughs> this was on seven weeks delivery and took a year and a half. Uh, <laughs> So I bought that on a Kickstarter, it cost me $59, I bought that at 120 quid, that does a lot more than that, I'll only be weighing this for a week. So <laughs> a lot of wearable stuff basically, as you can imagine. Uh, but I, do, I, don't, I don't do B2C software, so I really can't comment on that. Uh, interesting, we're, we're seeing a, a big resurgence in just British manufacturing really, very high tech, not perhaps not the audience here tonight, I don't know, hopefully there might be a few, but just people who make things very cleverly, uh, very top end. Um, We've got, for example, a carbon composite wheel manufacturer, you know, and that's you, you know world leaders in this, and uh, that's just really quite exciting. It's uh, for Britain, they really are, you know, specialists at this. So we're seeing a number of those sorts of companies, and certainly very well received by our, our investors. What we love are um, tech angels. We get people that come along and go, "I'm a tech angel, darling." All I can possibly look at is tech. They come to one of our events. We have a very full understanding that one of the last things that they will invest in is going to be tech. Because in a weird sort of way, unless you are hardwired, hardcore, and, and you just want to look at that, we have 203 angels who do just do tech. But it's actually so much about the personality. So it's, it's bizarre. 18% of all the deals that we do are, um, are tech. It gets most of the press. Um, but bigger than that is you know, sort of food and drink. Um, absolutely huge. Um, absolutely huge across the planet. So um, in our Hong Kong, Singapore offices, um, um, a lot of um, sustainable, a lot of eco, a lot of clean, a lot of um, cloud back on that again. They're incredibly keen um, at that sort of thing. In Mexico, it's all about food and drink. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's all. In Germany, it's all about tech, nothing but tech. There is nothing else but tech in Germany. <laughs> They're really interesting people. Okay, so I'm going to be, I'm going to challenge you. I reckon one of the biggest themes is going to be what is sort of social impact. And that as we all get, all those clean living 18 year olds, I don't know, I don't know what the average age is here, but it's younger than me. And, you know, the, 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 the desire to do things that change the world but do good. I think is going to be one of the major themes that grows as as time goes on. So I would say if you want to differentiate yourself and you're a tech company, you know, look what Innocent did around 10% of their profits to charity. Um, and try and think that if you want to, you know, there's lots of tech, so why don't you be the tech that changes the world in some, does some good for something or someone. But also make money as well. What? Also make oh yeah, no, 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 don't, don't understand. Why, why, why I, I had a brilliant thing once, somebody, was asking me about sort of the whole not-for-profit thing and, and the whole angel stuff and some and a quite clever person said, um, if you're not making a profit, you're stupid. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> Did you hear that, what's that? Are they making a profit when they yeah, sell for they 20 billion? They will make a profit one day, though. That's why they've been bought. Shareholder profit. <laughs> Well, you know, the figures are that of the 10 businesses we invest in, this is the average, and I'm sure this will get shot down by Bill specifically. Uh, one's a sort of home run unicorn, whatever, or not a unicorn, but a good one, a couple of medium ones. By a good one, I mean perhaps 10 or 20x. There's a couple of four or fives. There's probably two or three that would go bust. And the rest of them are what, what you're potentially saying there that turn into lifestyle businesses where there isn't necessarily an exit at all. Now, that, there's nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, you know, the, the whole of the UK is made up of lifestyle businesses of various sizes. So it's just, it doesn't, it, it, you know, an angel doesn't really want 
want to invest if there's no chance that that's going to happen. Now that it does happen anyway. So hockey sticks make no sense. Good solid business. You mentioned revenue. Personally, I don't need to invest when there's revenue at all. My my second best investment, which is a hybrid double decker bus engine here in London, has already spent two and a half million. We've got a bus floating around in East London, and the first order probably won't come in for another year. But when it does come in, the numbers are absolutely astronomical. So, yeah. I think. Well, again, I'm going to say it, it depends on the deal. I mean, you have to have an uh, the, the angel also has a number an, an understanding. If it, if it's a uh, if you're in alpha business and the angel has no understanding of alpha business, he may well invest, but you'd have to get to understand it. So, like Salesforce.com, not making a profit. But it's not making a profit because it spends every penny it has on new customer acquisition. So sh if it was to stop, if you didn't know that and you just looked at the numbers, you did a WhatsApp, you look at Twitter, you look at companies that are not making any revenue, does that mean that they're necessarily a bad business like Tesco's? I'm not sure. <laughs> no, of course not. So I mean, like, you know, you, you, it, it, it's all about your ability to actually be able to get that across to the angel. Um, to be honest with you, I think, the, I think the exit is absolutely key, as was picked up. I mean, you're asking somebody to invest, but how do they get the return? You know, uh, it's all very well f for yourself if it is the lifestyle business, but, you know, an investor has invested his or her hard-earned money sort of thing. Uh, they've got, there's got to be a, a, a return, really. Um, so you need to think about that, I think. Can I, well, can I just pick up on that point? Because I think what Scott's just absolutely summed it up perfectly, which is this about return of investment. So it might be that if you're that sort of established company, you're actually generating some cash, but you want something to expand, you actually maybe you're not going to offer the 10x, and it may not be suitable for angels, but it might be suitable for an investor who says, actually, I want to take a dividend out of it. I know the scary word dividend that we're not allowed to talk about, but actually I know an investor the, uh, who's got one deal which apparently was never going to give a great return, and they sort of said, oh, what are we going to do with it? And they said, oh, actually, it's chucking off quite a lot of cash. We'll take a dividend. He's had like five times his money back in the last three years because he changed his brain around. So, so I would say go and look for the type of investor who can understand the return of capital you're going to give him over the period he, she's invested rather than just go after the 10x people who probably won't be interested in your deal. So so I used to do a lot of work for Procter & Gamble, who are a very interesting firm and very hot on IP and branding and all this. And they always said that if you don't protect what you're doing and you talk about it, you have to assume that somebody might steal it if it's a really good idea, because wouldn't, wouldn't you sort of thing. Now, hopefully we all have far too much integrity to do that, but you, you get where I'm coming from. So um, in terms of things like trademarks, a trademark costs you about 750 quid. So I would expect you to go and work down Tesco's on the night shift until you generate your 750 quid in, in all honesty. You know, that you, sh you should be able to, f if, you, if you're real entrepreneurs, you should be able to find yourself that sort of money. Trade secrets should stay as trade secrets, e even with investors. You should be able to communicate it without actually telling, I mean, Coca-Cola didn't need to give away the formula. They just had a magic formula that when you tasted it, it was fantastic. So you should be able to solve that one. With patents, one of the things I always think is talk to the patent attorneys and negotiate terms. There's certain licensing fees that you have to pay on certain deadlines. But in terms of the advice they give you, you know, ask them to back you. Yeah, but what I'm saying is you can, the first person I'd go and talk to is find the best patent attorney you can, go and see them, say, I've got the most fantastic, guess what, you're going to be earning a lot of fees off of this over the next few years. Tell me exactly what the schedule of payments is. And then you say, well, I'll pay this bit now, and I'll pay this bit in three months, and this bit in six months and nine months. So don't, that's what an entrepreneur does. Don't not apply for the patent because you're scared of this potential big bill. Go and talk to people.
don't. The other thing just slightly to add is that uh, most investors, th th they don't necessarily need to know everything all at once in a sense. So there's degrees of confidentiality in some ways, obviously. I mean, by going through kind of regulated networks, uh, we are, I mean, all of our members all sign up to confidentiality. They don't initially want to see confidential things. There's a almost an investment teaser. You're not, you're just, you know, talking about the idea to sort of hook in interest. You're not actually sort of telling them everything, really. So you it's really only r once you've perhaps hooked in an investor, perhaps they might, you might even ask them to sign an NDA, something like that, perhaps, you know, then, then they, you know, before they write their check, perhaps they do need to see perhaps everything. But so it's not as, you know, I wouldn't feel as worried. I mean, to be honest with you, my other response to your question slightly was, sadly, ideas are very cheap. I mean, we see hundreds and hundreds of ideas every month, really, every week. It's all about the execution that people invest in, really. Um, you know, it's all about that team who just make it happen, who get the sales, get some traction, cobble together the money, as Modwena says, you know, go and work hard, get that 750 quid, get it sort of protected, get some sales, you've got a customer, then you've got something to shout about. was young but called Avanti and it was an entrepreneur bloke and he had this scientist bloke and what they really wanted to do was put satellites into space um, and that was the idea and it was some new sort of satellite and um, everyone was like don't be stupid you know who's going to trust a couple of star scientists and an entrepreneur bloke to do this so but what they did work out was that if they told all these media companies that they were going to put televisions into shopping centres that everyone when they walked past the television in the shopping centre would stop and watch the advert and because advertising is a really aggressive, exciting world, any new innovation is, you know, will be, you know, and this was quite big and you could see, sh you could absolutely see it, couldn't you? Shopping centers, all we have to do is buy the screens, then we'll sell the advertising. So they managed to get a whole business up and running doing screens in shopping centers. And they raised VC money and they got quoted on AIM, didn't they? I think, you know, it went a long way. In the meantime, they wanted, still wanted satellites and they told the investors they wanted satellites. But then they quietly in the background went off and, got the satellite up and running and then won the European Space Agency, whatever it was, and now they've got satellites spinning around the world. So do you remember there are two steps? There can be two or three or four steps to getting your end game. Don't necessarily give up on the big one, but maybe you have to do some little steps on the way around. I suspect that you guys don't necessarily agree with that, but there's some sort of subtlety to it. Where do you guys in particular feel that Angel would make a better option for VC for, um, for an entrepreneur? Actually, I'll, I'll gladly start. Um, to be honest with you, my personal view of VCs is that they've moved out of that sort of uh, little grid that you've just sort of uh, portrayed. They're not about risk. They're about pouring petrol onto a burning fire. Uh, it really is the, you know, the business angels, perhaps obviously the friends and family in all the early stage, those are the people and, you know, uh, that are taking the risk, you know, the actual venture bits. I'm not too sure really what VCs, you know, it's about more, I in our generalist world, I know that there's perhaps more in the States and perhaps there's specific tech VCs that are very early stage, but we're seeing them all slightly move up the tree and out of the risk sort of zone. Um, another bit that you've missed slightly, which they're hard to find, are the, are the family offices. So these are sort of ultra high net worth individuals that are so wealthy they employ a team of people to manage their wealth. And we, you know, we see those guys as the sort of almost the new VCs. They are very, you know, can write very large checks. They like to get involved in early stage. Um, they can provide more than money. They can provide lots of treasury functions, back office, all sorts of things, very supportive. It's, not, it's their money, so they're not you know, beholden to sort of investors, so they can have a longer sort of horizon, really. So they're very important, actually, in growing kind of um, investment class. They are hard to find. 
Uh, the angel networks, I mean, we, for example, have about 50 of those on our books, and I'm sure colleagues ha have some as well, really. But um, interesting source. I think, you know, <coughs> I, don't, I don't think things have moved on uh, since uh, friends and family, angels and VCs, but we, um, we see a lot of very young entrepreneurs going, you know, I really, I'm, I'm setting myself up, I want VC funding. Why? Why do you want VC funding? The average tenure of the chief executive who accepts VC funding is eight and a half months. The last thing some spreadsheet bunny VC wants is an attention deficit, dyslexic entrepreneur going, yep, I'm going down that path, going down that path. Wow, look at that bright, shiny thing over there. I'm going to move into here and move over No, no, no. You have to move back to there. I've got, uh, we've got four companies that um, have accepted VC funding um, this year so far. Um, miserable. The guys are miserable because it's a, it's a world of difference. It's a, it's, it's they're there, as, um, as Scott more eloquently espoused, and really just there to make money. Angels are there to support you in actually running your business, doing what you're passionate about, giving you a slap in the face when you go, oh, bright new shiny thing over here, or actually encouraging you to look at bright new shiny thing, and somebody else can carry on doing that. You know, it's, it's a world of difference. So you know, to compare the angels and the VCs is to compare apples and hippopotamuses. It's, it just doesn't really, doesn't make sense. VCs are having a really tough time as well. You know, so traditionally we would love VCs because that's how the angels would get bought out. That's how they would release their capital again. Really not happening. It's not, it's not so much that they're not popular, it's just that the, the, the vast majority of VCTs, the vast majority of venture capitalists are not making the sums of money that once they were. And um, it's really difficult to fuck up a VC business, but somehow they're managing to do that. And that's their problem. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's cool. How do we, how, how do you get um, 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 returns? The way that we recommend people um, to do it is um, depending on your relationship with the angel. You say, um, um, I've given you 100,000 for a 10% stake. In two years time, uh, you take your 10% stake back and you give him out of retained profits 200,000 or 250,000. Some obviously not pre-ordained um, thing because that would be against EIS rules. You can't, you can't do that actually, Bill. It's five years. You cannot pay, pay back angels inside five years without very special dis dispensations in the HMRC. So I've just been through all that recently. No, no, nothing to do with the IS without actually actually pay, pay buy shareholders out from retained profits in under five years. You look at the rules. Anyway, I just want to challenge them both about something else. One, the VCs w are m have moved down market and they're playing around because they want later deal flow because they want to get in early and they want to put in a couple of 300,000. They don't like it, of course, because the due diligence they do and the legals and everything means they've, they've made a loss at the moment they've, they've ri written the check to start with. But they do like that because they can monitor and carry on from that. And there are some specialized ones that do it, probably less than before. And secondly, if you've got a business that's not a software business that needs loads of capital, you cannot rely on angel and angel networks to fund that f for very far. You've got to get involved in the bigger players. And family office is a great idea, actually, but even, you know, you almost certainly will have a VC in there. And eight and a half months, Bill and I are going to disagree about so many things. Like <laughs> it's a complete load of bollocks. <laughs> I don't know what that figure, where you got that figure from, Bill, but it's not that at all. I imagine it's probably no more than three years, but it certainly isn't only eight and a half months. So don't get frightened by VCs. They will, they will put mechanisms into place to protect themselves, which angels won't, though. So if there's some hiccup, some problem, then the early investors, including the founders, of course, who are investors as well, will get screwed if, if, you know, if you're not careful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defend VCs on the grounds that I'm a non-exec of one, if I may. So it's, I think it's, um, I think it's, uh, I think what Peter said is absolutely right. That understand what they're trying to achieve. So the first thing is VCs are investing other people's money, so they need to get not just a return back for themselves, but back to that other person. And they'd quite like to earn a bit on the way through, which is fair enough because we all want to earn a bit of money. So, um, uh, so uh, they are, as you say, they're a different beast. I think if you want something where there's a fairly for more formal structured, but I would say definitely um, pretty much the, the good ones, the good cool ones around here and in London, they're very supportive because they know that if they don't support you, it's all going to go wrong. And then they're left invested in, what, a company with no management team, which isn't going anywhere. That, that doesn't look good to those investors who've in back them. 
So um, I would say, you know, bigger sums, but well, I mean, well, our fund's just put in a 25 grand investment into a startup e company, um, because, like you say, they want to be they want to be seeing, reading, you know, understanding the market, and they understand the future by backing people like you, um, and and understand their return horizons versus angels, because you can have some really great VCs and some really bad angels, and you can have some really amazing angels and some really terrible VCs. That's where you need to get that chemistry bit is the bit that matters so much, and, uh, and understanding objectives. Um, the problem is there's, there's many different types in some ways, but um, because you see, you're going to get some angel investors. I mean, you, usually it's not just one. You might just, you know, bring in a um, uh, syndicate, which might be start off as an informal and then become sort of slightly formal. Um, what the ideal thing is, it's somebody who brings more than money. To be honest with you, so bringing added value. Ideally, they've got say a bit of a track record in the space. They can obviously bring mentoring, contacts, help you to sort of grow. They might take a formalised position in the business. Could be a non-exec. Um, but, you know, so uh, the ideal thing is to probably try and get a blend. You really want sort of people that are going to be um, obviously interested in the business, so they wouldn't invest otherwise, but then be becoming supportive, becoming, you know, you can wheel them out at trade fairs, all that sort of stuff really. But the problem is that, you know, there are some that want to be very active and there are some that want to be very passive uh, and you've just got to try and find those people really. Yeah, just what I was about to say, yeah, because there are actually three, actually. There's people who are investor directors. I'll explain that in a minute. And I'm on seven startup boards. There are then the people who are, will get involved and interested and so on. And then there's the passive ones. So there's, there's the ones who really are involved. And, and generally, the deals I do and all the, you know, my mates, the people I'm involved with, will insist on them being an investor director on the board, which is quite different. And we haven't gone to crowdfunding, but most crowdfunding sites don't necessarily n need that. And there's all kinds of... Ups, well, there aren't many upsides, there's all kinds of downsides with that. So the person on the board will be, you know, generally older, generally had the experience, generally provide governance, they provide connections, they provide challenging. They'll be raising another round, would be very much easier with that person on the board because the information flow from back to the syndicate will be very much m better and more believable if there is an angel on the board. So, um, You do. You do the DD. So, you know, you can do the DD on me. You can talk to people. My, my portfolio is, I mean, not everything the same, clearly, but my portfolio is all on my website. You can, you can contact them. When, when this double-decker bus engine, I'm on the board of that, they did more DD than I could believe before they took me on as an investor. Sorry? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Companies House will give a list if they're already in a director of companies pick up the phone, you know, you're the entrepreneur, you're the ones going out there, flogging, you know, making the connections, being proactive about it, so go for it. Our third sense is an angel, they don't, they don't waste your time. And that, I mean that in every single direction, not just that they don't ignore you. I mean, it's that every time you talk to them, you think that's valuable. And that you don't need to talk to them when you don't need to talk to them. If you can have that sort of relationship, then you I think, would you fair say that, sir? Yeah, exactly. You want a good working relationship. And if it starts to fail, then something needs to be done about it. So. I think the essence as well, in terms of identifying what it is that you need, is that you have to understand. So doing that filter of who's here and what team has, you know, the, the skills that are missing in the group, um, see what's actually missing. So the average person who pitches at one of our events has 3.4 angels interested in them, then you turn the tables. And you go, right, okay, you're gonna give them the money, that's, that's, that's cool, but can you bring me that alpha, beta, and gamma? And no, I can't. Well, that's, that's, that's cool, but in, do you have some mates that could bring me alpha, beta, and gamma? Because it's, it's, it's naive to just look for the money, um, as, as somebody said much, much earlier, so, um, and, and as we've <coughs> resisted talking about crowdfunding, but the, the one kind of thing with certainty was, younger entrepreneurs, once again, that we see, who just want the money, we pass them on to first generation crowdfunding sites. And not eight and a half months, five, uh, they're gonna be out of business quite, quite soon. They will be out of business because they're missing the whole point of angels. The whole point of angels isn't just a replacement for the banks, which have sadly shut up shop. It is the fact, um, as um, Scott said, it's about the mentorship, it's about the business experience, 
It's about the contacts that they bring to bear because they want you to succeed because they have a sizable chunk in your business. They are then complicit in your business. <coughs> if you're not getting that, you're missing out on a, on a whole world and you're entering into a whole world of pain. Okay. Um, yeah. Lady there. Um, I have a question with regard to the duration of the business and how much equity you want to give away or negotiate. How do you negotiate the best deal, really? So it's, it's, it's a great question to actually come at it from that angle. So, what equity should you give away in the business? Because I'm a really sad accountant and investment banker, you actually look at it the other way around. So it's like, what's your business valued at? And you can actually have a look at the um, fictitious three euro cash flow moving forward and take some sort of view on it. And we can value businesses incredibly quickly. So if anybody wants me to value their business, I can do it incredibly quickly. And then it's about how much money do you actually need? So if you think your business is worth a thousand on some sort of weird valuation, which is gonna be wrong, but it's pick a number out there, you need a hundred, then you give away 10% of your business. So it's, it's about looking at it the other way around. Mm -hmm. Our average deal size is 203,000 for an 18% stake, which means nothing. But. Um, valuation is the biggest issue between entrepreneurs and investors, because you want valuation up here, and the investor wants it down here. So, and it's, a, it's basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a curve, essentially, because you either, you know, how much do you need the money? How quickly do you need the money? Can you hold out? Have you already raised part of the money? You know, there's so many things. I mean, to be honest with you, this whole point, if you're a pre-revenue company and you're suddenly valuing on the, on the future, I mean, that's a complete waste of time. It's always about, well, what's it worth now sort of thing? You know, how much money have you put in? How much money has been invested into the business? You know, have you got any sales contracts, sort of letters of intent, anything to sort of justify? Then, sadly, it's just about what the market is prepared to pay, really. And um, there's a whole load of sort of stats out there, but there's a whole load of networks. There's a whole load of companies that want to raise finance. It's about really what you know what sounds about right. And sadly, as, as Bill mentioned, you know, the thing about valuations is it's just a function of the about the money you're trying to raise, really. So if you're trying to raise a million, you're going to think, oh, I don't want to give away sort of more than 50% or something, you know, so all of, all of a sudden then the pre-money valuation is a million, you're now worth two million pounds as a post-money valuation. And it was just a business plan a minute ago on a bit of paper, really. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that would be done in milestones probably in two rounds. If you want to raise a million, you don't really go to angels initially. You can do, but it, you, more likely you'll get it, you'll raise 250 or whatever, and then you get to a certain point where the extra 750 is at about four or five times the valuation of the first one. So... Um, yeah, I mean, because there's so much activity nowadays, there are plenty of comparators. No two businesses are the same, of course, but if you look round, you can't tell from the asking price, inverted commas, on a crowdfunding site or, or whatever, wherever you can find them, what, what the actual deal's done at, but you probably work it out backwards from, if you go into Judel or Company's House, to work out how much this cash has gone in and, and, and the amount of shares that have been sold. Another way of um, looking at it, there's two things I've heard. One is that um, you're going to, and again, I'm going to say sell about 35% of your business, plus or minus 5%, regardless of how much money gets invested in you. Because broadly speaking, the investors want you to have a mental sense that you still own and control the business, but they need enough of a stake to be a pain in your back. Okay? So uh, that that is not, an, you know, that's a good starting point to think about. So then the other thing is raise as much as you can for 35%. Um, the other thing to think about, I think, which is quite interesting, is how much money do you want to make out of this endeavour from where you've started? One million, ten million, a billion? And then how much money do you need to achieve your billion? Okay, and then how much are they going to have to make in order to get the return they want? And then if you look into this date in the future and start working back, and one of the reasons I should say, even though it's a bit of a mental game you're playing, remember most people who raise money will raise it, what, two, three, four, five times? So... 18, 18 rounds of investment. It's quite addictive, actually. It's one of the most interesting. It's better than Coke, I think, the whole raising fund. You know, that if you've done it once, you think you can do it again. Off you go. And every time that happens, there's a new person coming in, potentially saying, actually, I quite fancy that 35%, 25% as well. So people keep getting dilute, diluted down and down as there are more and more rounds. So try and envisage this future. Most companies sell for less than 20, is it 20 million pounds, 50 million dollars in the world? but it's certainly less than 20 million in the UK. So, you know, if you've got an ambition to be a 100 million, 200 million, 500 million pound valuation company in next years, 
you're going to have to work that very first round because we were talking earlier, weren't we, about if you get the first round wrong, then you have what's called a really bad down round, which is when you get like really squashed by the next lot of money that comes in. And the per and entrepreneurs will always suffer in that process too, so um, maybe not as much as others, but... Principles the same, yeah. So, yeah, the buying the angels out. The angels are usually bought out by three things. One is an IPO, you know, flotation. One is a trade sale, which is the most usual. And the third one is a VC coming in and not wanting all these crappy little angels floating around or getting in the way. They, they become shrapnel, particularly if you've got 40, 50 of them. So they'll come in, they'll buy at a certain point. Most angels, if it's, it will probably come out at that point because when the VC comes in, as we said earlier on, more risk is introduced, founders lose control, etc., potentially lose control. So we would exit at that point. Even if we might have any, I don't know, we're talking about 10x, weren't we? Even if it's only a 4x at that point, you know, because the risk. Because four times your money is still, you know, a decent amount of money. If you've got 50K and you've got 150K for, if you weren't involved with the business, for doing not very much. Depends how much your company's worth, depends how much you need, depends on the different shareholders of your families and they're holding 51%, 75% of your company already. Well depends where you want to go. We'll still be interested at that stage um, if, you, if you let go more or less. Like Absolutely. I mean, it's like, you know, people are still buying um, Berkshire Hathaway shares um, and, and you're only getting 0.00017% of the company. Um, That's because you haven't got the phone. <laughs> I mean, I mean, so you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good question in principle, but it's incredibly difficult to answer. No, sorry, it's impossible to answer because it absolutely. 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 Yeah, I mean, if you take the, the SEIS round, which is probably what you're talking about, because there's obviously great tax advantages there, it, I, I don't think an angel group will probably t want to take less than 10% for that. So it's a pre-money valuation of 1.35 or something like that. Yes. No, no, it's very positive. You're the, you, yeah, you, the, 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 I mean, there obviously there's love involved and there's different sort of trust, but at least you can get some cash into the business, see how far you can get. Of course, that cash will allow you to increase the valuation as well, won't it? And in fact, it may, if you get 100K in or something, you're probably beyond SEIS and into a proper round then.